Give it a second. Good. Well, um, there's a good joke at this time of year that uh, anything can be the best of the year. So this will be the best uh, Bethel service of the year, uh, at least until next week. Anyway, <laughs> um, we've uh, we've we've got unfinished business with the Book of Acts because we started that. We've been looking at Acts before we uh, paused for some Christmas things, and uh, we will uh, come back to that in time. But as it's the first Sunday, I, I, I said to the family this week, I almost put off. Uh, looking at our year verse until next week to give me a bit more time. Obviously, this last week has been taken up with Christmas and other things. But I started thinking about it. And as our usual uh, plan and tradition is, at the first service of the year, we, we pretty much always, for the last few years anyway, have, have uh, looked at something which is going to stick with us through the year, hopefully. Something which we'll, uh, we'll come back to a few times, which uh, will be a kind of motto for the year. And uh, so I want to do the same thing. Uh, uh, this morning. Last last year's verses have been very helpful. There they are, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. And uh, they, they they were very helpful. As I said on Thursday, I, I had no prophetic vision when I picked these last year. But uh, in God's gracious providence, they have proved relevant and helpful to us throughout this year, certainly to me anyway, and to others I know. Um, we are wasting away. Uh, we have troubles but we have something that outweighs those, uh, something else that we fix our eyes on so that we're encouraged. Well, um, there is a bit of tension uh, sort of over Christmas time and after Christmas for me thinking, well, what are we going to look at for the next year? Because once I've picked it, I'm not going to change it. And uh, once I've preached on it the first time, we're stuck with it, really. So there's a slight bit of tension. And I feel that a little bit wondering uh, what verses to choose. And so I made a file on my computer and I started uh, sort of putting verses into this file, possibles, uh, options and verses that came to mind. Uh, but when I came to the verses that I wanted us to look at, I, I just felt that they were they were such a, a strong encouragement to us. No matter what this next year will bring, and, and we obviously don't know, uh, and it felt like the right verses for this year. So I'll tell you what they are in a moment, but let me just give you a couple of illustrations to set the scene and to introduce it really. Um, now, um, I don't know if many of you are big sports fans. I know some of you are casual sports fans perhaps, but it is it is sort of almost compulsory, isn't it, if you are Welsh, uh, to even if you're not, you're not interested in much of the sport, to support the Welsh national rugby team. You have to do that. It's, it's part of your entry qualification, I think, into the Welsh culture. And uh, and it has been a while, hasn't it, since anyone has has attended a large sporting event, stood in the crowd, you know, is shoulder to shoulder with fellow fans. Um, and I don't know if you're like me, you watch, I was watching something the other day that was obviously recorded before lockdown. When you see big crowds together, it makes you a little bit nervous, doesn't it? A bit anxious. You wonder what they're doing. But maybe one day soon those things will happen again. But if, if those events are held, one of the things that Welsh fans look for as they look down the fixture list is home games, isn't it? Home, a game in Cardiff. Um, because there's something tangible that is added to the team performance when... There's all of their fans there in their home ground singing. They are for them uh, in a very special way. They are rooting for them. They are singing for them. They are cheering for them. Um, so there's something about that, about having someone for you. Um, now, most of you know there is a far more important sport that's much closer to my heart, cycling. And uh, I know that you're all big fans of cycling here as well. But it always makes me smile. You, you've probably never watched it. But when you watch the Tour de France, um, the cameras follow the, the cyclist. And there are a couple of Welsh cyclists who are who are good and are, uh, are in the uh, group of cyclists there. Garrett Thomas and there's another guy called Luke Rowe who's as, as good as he is almost. And it's always encouraging. It always makes me smile when you see them slogging up some mountain somewhere in the middle of France. And um, there's all sorts of nationalities on the side of the road, all sorts of colours, all sorts of noise. But then they'll they'll come around a corner and they'll just be maybe a, a camper van or something with a with a Welsh flag on the side and it always makes me smile a bit to think that somebody has gone to all the trouble and all the effort of of travelling all that way and of probably going up that mountain several days before to get their space just to put their little flag you know in front of uh, in front of their their supporters uh, in front of their sportsmen and it must be a great encouragement to to the riders to know there's someone there who is for them. Someone there who's on their side, especially someone there who has gone to those lengths for them. Uh, change the image a bit. Maybe uh, imagine you're in a courtroom and uh, you're standing trial for something you you didn't do. You've been wrongly accused 
and uh, you're not a lawyer, so you can't really ad adequately defend yourself. But there is someone in the court who knows your case, who knows the truth, who has evidence that will acquit you and can plead for you, can stand for you. Uh, your lawyer, hopefully, is there for you um, and to help you to get justice. Or think of one final situation, your family and their relationship to you. You know, other people might not always get on with you or understand you or be patient with you. Your personality might just rub some people up the wrong way. That's inevitable in life. You might get criticized by others. You might get uh, ignored or, or insulted. But when you come home to your family, hopefully, those that know you well, uh, whoever they might be, they are for you, aren't they? They're on your side. They want the best for you. They love you and they care for you. And you're safe with them. It's great to have someone who is for you. Well, guess which verses I'm going to leave with you for this coming year from Romans 8. Well, no, no prizes for guessing. Here they are. Romans 8, verses 31 and 32. Now, uh, we're going to look at these verses this morning briefly, but let me just read them to you. What then shall we say in response to this? That is what's already been said. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him? graciously give us all things. The central theme of uh, verse 31 there is, is so simple to state, isn't it? So, it's so uh, short and to the point, but it's also so profound and so encouraging for us to really grasp. And I hope that we will grasp it uh, even this morning as we look at these verses for the first time and we'll grasp it as we go through the year and look at them again. Now, obviously, this verse doesn't, doesn't stand on its own, and uh, it's in a great chapter and in a tremendous book of the Bible. So we'll have to understand a bit of that uh, even this morning. But if you've got questions here at this point as we look at these verses, just pause them for a bit and just think of that simple statement for a moment. God is for us. He's for us. God is for us. Who can be against us? Uh, the if there is not is not because Paul is in any doubt. He's not saying, well, if if hopefully God is for us, uh, it's not an if of of doubt. He, he's just making the comparison. Um, if he's for us, then this will be true. And he is for us. God is not against us if we belong to him. If we're in Christ, God is for you. So um, there will be a, a number of questions. I hope that you do have questions that, that come to mind as we look at these verses and we won't answer them all this morning. But uh, we'll make a start. And let me, all I want to do this morning is just pull this verse apart, really. Just look at each little bit in turn and, and bring something, some application that is something good for our souls at the start of this new year. Something that will help us move forward into 2021 with all that God will bring to us. So I'm going to put the verse up uh, on the screen and highlight the, the little bit that we're looking at. And, um, that will, and I'll just keep it there in front of us. It's good to have God's word in front of us. And uh, we'll work our way through it. And I want to just pull out, so I've got four points. I want to pull out just four applications for us for today. Well, first of all, then, um, what shall we say? What then shall we say in response to this? Now, obviously, these verses were not penned by the Apostle Paul uh, as a kind of sound bite to put on the wall or on our motto cards or wherever else as a, as a, as a memory verse or something like that. I think, I think, Probably the Apostle Paul would have used Twitter if he'd been around now. And, uh, you know, on Twitter, there used to be a character limit of 140 characters. I think it's I think it's doubled now, isn't it? 280 characters, which these two verses would fit into just. Um, but they're not a self-contained kind of tweet. They're not a they're not a soundbite. They're not a, a, sh a shot in the dark. They are part of a section and part of a book. Uh, and there is a, fl a flow of thought here and it starts really of course at the beginning of the book of Romans um, so really to do it justice we need to go back a little bit I'm not going to do a, a survey of the whole book of Romans for you this morning but we need to you need to get a bit of context and also of course this this is not properly speaking we call it the book of Romans but it wasn't a book Paul didn't sit down to write a book and get a publisher and it was a letter it's a letter to a church and uh, Paul is writing to Christian brothers and sisters in the church in Rome uh, so we need to understand a little bit about that as well, wh who, who he's writing to, why he's writing, and what's going on. Let me just give you a quick intro. I would um, I would recommend to you the Bible Project videos. I've used them in the church in the past, and th they've got two on Romans, and it's a very helpful overview, and I'll put the link on that in the email as well. You can have a look if you want to. Uh, so the Apostle Paul is writing. He's writing probably from Corinth, 
after his third missionary journey. So in our studies in Acts, we haven't quite got there yet. We're, we're right at the beginning of his missionary journeys. But this is probably after his third one, and he's collected money from some of the Gentile churches for the Jewish church in Jerusalem. He's going to take the gift there. But he has plans after he's gone to Jerusalem to go to Spain. Of course, he didn't get there, but that was his, that was his plan. And uh, this church at Rome had been somewhat divided. You may know a little bit of the history there. The emperor, uh, Roman emperor, had, had expelled all the Jews. So the church in Rome had been just Gentile for a while, but then the Jews had been allowed back. And so there was this, there was a bit of division in the church. And there are these Jew-Gentile tensions, and Paul is seeking to address that. Uh, and he's also... Um, looking for funding for his mission to Spain. So there's something about him rehearsing his doctrinal position. He's saying, this is where I am. This is where I stand. W would you support this mission? It's a kind of funding letter. Uh, and he's also perhaps putting into writing what he's going to say when he gets back to Jerusalem, to the mainly Jewish church there, to, to convince them of his mission to the Gentiles. He wants to, sh to lay out the gospel. So in Romans, there is a lot about the Jew and Gentiles and the one church together and the unity of the church and that kind of thing. So there's a kind of there's a few reasons there why Paul in this book of Romans goes through the gospel, why he talks through in quite some detail what the gospel means, what the good news of Jesus means, what it means to be a Christian. Uh, and so he, he, he begins the first few chapters, he's speaking about God's righteousness. The, the gospel reveals God's righteousness and as God's righteousness is revealed um, it, it's creating this new humanity this new group of people this new church and fulfilling God's promise promises to Israel uh, in the past and bringing the church together um, and this this section chapters about chapters five to chapter eight is showing how how this good news how this message of good news creates this one new humanity no longer in Adam and in sin, but in the Lord Jesus and in the spirit. And now chapter eight is a well-known chapter. We read the whole thing there, but you'll know bits of it perhaps quite well. But it begins with a therefore. <clears throat> so chapter eight is following on from what came before. And uh, <clears throat> Paul is saying in the gospel, we're not condemned by the law any longer, but we're set free by the Lord Jesus and the spirit to live for him. We have a new status. Let's look at these uh, two verses. This is verses 28 to 30, these three verses. We know that all, in all things God works for the good of those who love him and who've been called according to his purpose. For, now look at verse 29, those God foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. <clears throat> and those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. That's our status as Christians. That's what Christians are. They're not just people who've kind of made a life decision and have chosen to live this way as opposed to another way they are people who god has has, has looked looked on and called and justified that means declared not guilty and glorified now there's a lot in those verses that we could unpack i'm not going to do that today but look what god has done for us and at least this is what paul has in mind when we come to our verses and he says what shall we say in response to these things i think he's talking about all that he said but especially this bit let me put those verses. What shall we say in response to, to this? This last part of chapter eight is full of rhetorical questions and rhetorical questions are designed to draw you in, uh, to, to make a response, to get you engaged. What shall we say? You're meant to think, yeah, yeah, what do I say? You're meant to answer the question or to start thinking about the answer in your mind. And there are lots of questions in this last part of the chapter that are meant to do that. They are meant to... Uh, to cause you to respond to the gospel and to respond together. I was listening to somebody's talk and they said, Paul says, what shall we say? Remember, he's writing to a church, a community of people. So he's not writing to someone in isolation, locked away in their house saying, what, what do I say to this? He say, what, what, sh what should we say? Christians together, what shall we say in response to this? We're meant to respond. We're meant to talk about this together. The great truths of the gospel, of God's grace to us in the Lord Jesus, the message of our salvation, is not, is not beyond us. We don't say, well, it's nothing, I, I can't grasp this. We can all grasp something of it, no matter who we are. And the truth of the gospel is not kind of hard and technical uh, and something that leaves us unaffected. You know, when you read, a, you read a technical manual sometimes, it doesn't move your heart, does it? Uh, even if you're interested, it's, it's dry. 
well, the, the gospel is not that. This is not Paul saying, here's what happened in a kind of business-like way and, well, take it or leave it. He's, he's, you're meant to respond. It's not just for our intellectual heads, it's for our hearts. And these great truths demand and expect and require a response. What shall we say? And the implication is this, it must be something. It, you can't just say nothing. The gospel ought to draw us to apply our salvation so that it affects our our hearts, our emotions, our behavior, our, our outlook on life, our perspective on things, our reasoning, our will, the things that we go for, the things that we avoid, our priorities, the things that we spend our time and money and effort and energy on, just the, everything, the way that we think and live. So let me leave you with this simple application here. This year, uh, say the gospel often to one another. Make it, uh, make it a goal, I'm not big on New Year's resolutions, but make it a goal at least for this year to talk about Jesus and his salvation to other Christians, even just to remind them of verses from the Bible. We had a great meeting on Thursday, just sharing verses of scripture together. There were no long sermons, there were no great expositions, nobody uh, spoke for long, but there were just verses of scripture that we'd been helped by. And there is something encouraging about that, something we ought to do more often, I think we may Try and plan that in a little bit. What shall we say in response to this? Something, something, some truth about God, about our Saviour, about his love for us, about his grace and mercy to us, something about him being for us to encourage us and to build us up, to build each other up. Okay, well, that's the first bit. Second bit, if God is for us, who can be against us? This will be a bit briefer, I think, the next few sections. It's another question, isn't it? Another rhetorical question. You're meant to answer this in a certain way in your head as you hear the question, aren't you? And you know what the answer is, of course. If God is for us, who can be against us? You're not meant to say, well, possibly this person or that thing. You're meant to say, no one. God is for us. Who can be against us? And the answer really, I suppose, depends on your view of God, because you might say, well, you know, my view of God is quite small. and I'm not sure if he's for me. I'm not sure if that means anything, because there might be all sorts of other things that would be against us. But if your God is the God of the Bible, then the answer is a resounding and a decisive no one. If God is for us, who can be against us? No one. None can stand. There is no higher authority, no higher who can be against us. That really counts in the grand scheme of things. Now, if you've been with us through the book of Acts, or if, you, if you've read the book of Acts, you will know that Paul didn't lead a kind of charmed and privileged and easy life, did he? Uh, we've, we, we read some of those things in our studies before. The gospel ministry, in fact, Paul was involved in, caused him a great deal of pain and suffering. Uh, he had plenty of people against him, and he felt it painfully. He was beaten up and stoned and thrown out of places and battered for the gospel. And you might say, Paul, have you forgotten that here? You know, when he says, who can be against us, is he, is he conveniently forgetting all of the people and all of the uh, sort of groups and all of the gatherings that were strongly against him? Well, when he asks who can be against us, he knows, he knows, doesn't he, that the world and the flesh and the devil are all against us. But what he means here is that if God is for us, which he is, then no one can be against us in any way that really counts. Um, I've shared a few times um, at the church here, John Piper's um, look at the book studies, you know, where he, put, he puts the text on the screen and he kind of scribbles all over it. And uh, he, he has one of these verses. Again, I'll give you a link to it. But he, he puts it this way. He says, no one can be successfully against us. There'll be lots of people against us. Paul knew people against him. But none of it will succeed, really, ultimately, in the grand scheme of things. So even if someone wants to harm us, even if they take our lives, then still God is for us. And all they will have done is rushed us into his presence a little bit earlier. Well, who, who is the us here in verse 31? God is for us. It's those that Paul has just been speaking about, those who are loved by God, known by him, predestined, called, justified, glorified. It's any who have run to Jesus for salvation and are following him. There's no higher authority. There's no greater power. There's no enemy that can succeed and can successfully stand against us if God is for us. So if he is for us, who else is there to question that and contradict it? And the answer is no one. 
But is God for us? Well, yes, he certainly is. And the next part will tell us that he didn't spare his own son to save us. So he is certainly for us. He showed that he's for us. So here's my application this year. Remember in everything, in everything, right? In every single thing. Remember that in everything, if you're in Christ, he is for you. He's not against you. He's for you. Think of an exam, uh, either an examiner or an exam invigilator who wanders around the room. You know, they're just waiting, aren't they, for someone to break the rules so that they can tell them off or kick them out. And God is not like that. He's not, he's not just looking and waiting for us to fail. He's for us. He's on our side. He's rooting for us, loving us so much as to do all in his power to rescue us. And it means that he will succeed in this. Not, he'll not just give it his best shot and hope for the best. He, he, he is for us and he will succeed because if God is for us, there isn't anyone who can be against us in any meaningful way. All that comes against us then must, must fail, must fall, must fail. Our sin is no barrier to God's saving power. Our enemies are no obstacle to his love for us. The devil has no weapons with which to do us any real damage. And there are many things, aren't there, in life that, that seem to be against us. There are many life experiences, and we've had some last year, and we're going to have some this year, aren't we, among our number. Things which make it seem like there is a force against us. And you, you could put a formidable list together, you know, illness and suffering and pain and sorrow and our own sin and regrets. Many, many things might be against us. But if God is for us, then all those things amount to nothing. This year, remember in everything that God is for you. Next bit. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Without this next part, we might say, well, God is for us. And we might get a little bit triumphalistic and say, well, we, you know, we, we, God is for us. God's on our side. You know, sometimes you encounter that. I've, I've encountered that with people who are not Christians. And they say, oh, well, of course, you, you know, ev everything will be well for you. You've got the man upstairs to look after you and so on. As if, as if, we're, as if we get special, you know, special privileges at, at every turn. As if the sun will shine on us all the time and we'll win prizes. And, you know, as if everything will go well for us. Well, let's not get triumphalistic about God being for us, because in the next verse, Paul reminds us of the cost of our salvation. Why was there a cost? Well, because we, we can't do it ourselves. We don't save ourselves. God being for us doesn't mean we are always right and perfect and good. Actually, the reason we know he is for us so clearly is that when all we, all we deserved was his anger and his wrath and hell itself, he gave his son for us. Uh, he didn't even spare the most precious for us, but gave him up. Um, it's not as if the, you know, it's not as if the father sent his kind of unwilling son for us to come here and die in our place. There's no conflict within God, the father and the son and the spirit. They determined that our sin would not, that our sin would be overturned by, by this gracious plan. And so Jesus came. And that plan centers upon the Lord Jesus Christ coming, being given up for us. It's interesting how the Bible talks about uh, the Lord Jesus being handed over, you know, by by the Jewish leaders or by the Roman authorities or so on. But it, it was the father who handed him over, ultimately, who gave him up for us all. That's the gospel story. It is the story, isn't it, behind all stories of redemption and salvation and love and glory. It's the, it's the underlying story that that informs those others. And it's so amazing and so beautiful and unexpected and, and even scandalous, we might say, that the eternal creator God should, should come into his creation, should come here for us, and then should stand in our place and carry our sin and bear it all before the Father's throne is, is breathtaking. God didn't spare his own son. That's how much he is for you. So you need to have no doubt at all that he is for you when he has demonstrated his love in this way. So here's my application on this point. This year, and there will be times when this happens, this year when you doubt that God is for you, remember the sacrificial love of God in, his, in, in the giving of his son. Remember that. Remember the gospel. Remember Jesus given for you. When you're not sure, you know, if, if something happens and you say, well, is, is God for me in this? Is he just beating me with a stick here? Remember what he has done for you in the giving of his son. Remember that and be assured that he is for you. 
see how much he is for you because he gave his own son. Okay, well, the last part of the verse. Oh, I forgot to put it up. I'll leave that there. There's one final part. And it's another rhetorical question, isn't it? Designed to pull a response from you. How will he not uh, also along with him graciously give us all things? Well, he will. He surely will. He certainly will. That's what it's saying. That's what how will he not also means. It means, of course he will. Surely, definitely, certainly he will give us all things. There's a, there's a, a bit of logic here. If he's given us Jesus, if he's given Jesus for you, why would he withhold any other good thing that you might need? It's an argument from the, the greater thing to the lesser thing. If the great thing is true, surely the lesser thing must also be true. Um, you have a good friend who would do anything for you. They've lent you their car on occasions. They've given their house to you on occasions. So you have no hesitation in going and asking them for a pint of milk. The, 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 the pint of milk is way less than the other things they've done for you. They've done the greater thing. So you're absolutely sure without question, they'll do the smaller thing. If God has demonstrated his love and given the life of his infinitely precious son to save us, what else would he possibly withhold from you? It doesn't make any sense, does it, to, to think that God either hates us or is indifferent to us or doesn't really like us. If, it doesn't make any sense for a, a, a Christian who is saved by the Lord Jesus to think of God's providence, you know, whatever it might be, all the things that come, come to us as less than his gracious gift to us. So what does this mean for us then? Well, here's how I'd like to put it for to you. This year, rejoice and be glad that along with Christ, God has given you all things. Now, that means you should be careful how you talk and think about what life brings to you in 2021 and what happened in 2020 as well. Because even that way of talking is a little bit risky, isn't it? What life brings to you, as if there's some force out there that's not God that has thrown these things at you, some fate or destiny or whatever. No, all is in the gracious hands of our Father, isn't it? Everything, all that comes to us, even COVID in 2020 was in his providential care of this world. So there isn't anything outside of his, of his care. He will, he will give us all things. Now, you might say, well, what about um, health and wealth and prosperity? Will he give us those things? Is this, a, is this a promise here in this verse that everything ought to be ours? We ought to just claim it and have it. And if we don't, there's something wrong. Well, no, I don't think it is that. The question is, would, would those things that we might desire in our, in our moments of greed, would they be God being for us in the best way? Would they be the best things for us? Would they make us lean upon him and trust him and love him more? Would they make us find our joy in God rather than in the things? Well, for most of us, I would say, <laughs> probably not. They would, they would be detrimental to our, to our following him. If the answer is yes to those questions, he might give them. There are, there are some gracious and godly rich people, but not many. For most of us, the all things means that all we need, the stuff that we actually need. Sin might rob us of, uh, of blessing, of health and wealth and happiness. Um, sin generally, other people's sin might have a detrimental effect upon us. The brokenness of this world through no fault of our own or others might mean loss or suffering for us. Some of those things might be self-inflicted. But the promise here is that if we have Christ, we in fact have all things, all the things that we need to follow him and glorify him. All things are his and we are his and he is ours. Um, Look at this. Oh, where's it gone? All right, let me read you a verse from uh, Corinthians. I obviously didn't put it on the screen. This is 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21. And uh, Paul is speaking to a church that is pulling itself apart because they're following different men and they've, they've got the wrong priorities. And here he says, so then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours. He says, there's no point saying, I follow this guy and I follow this guy and I follow this guy. He says, it's all yours. It's all, you're all together in this. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. In other words, you're joined to the Lord Jesus and he owns everything. So don't fret about these little things. There's no need to grasp after them. There's no need to be anxious for them. Come back always to your gracious father and trust him. He's given us Christ. He will give all else that we need. So we are to trust him. 
a lot, there is a lot more to say on these verses, isn't there? And there are verses around them. But God willing, we'll have opportunity to do that in 2021, to come back to them and to be encouraged. But God is for us. He's for you uh, if you are in Christ. And his, so there's the four lessons this year. Say the gospel often to one another. Rehearse it. Go through it. Talk about it. This year, remembering everything that if you are in Christ, he is for you. This year, when you doubt that he is for you, think about the gospel. Think about the sacrificial love of God in Christ. And this year, rejoice and be glad, finally, that along with Christ, God has given you all things. Well, I trust that will be a, a, an encouragement to you as we start this year. And uh, as we come back to these verses, it will continue to be a blessing to us. Uh, Romans 8, verses 31, 32. Uh, I'll probably put them on a card at some point and let you have those as well, so you can stick them up somewhere as well. Good. Well, let's pray, shall we? And, uh, and thank God for his word. Lord, we thank you that you are for us. We thank you for the, Lord, the, the, the tremendous encouragement that these verses are to us, Lord, that, uh, Lord, we, we ought to make a response to the gospel and it, it ought to be encouragement to us that you are for us, that, Lord, you have given the most precious, the infinitely uh, precious life of your dear son, for us to stand in our place, to bear our sin so that we might be uh, forgiven and washed and might uh, be joined to you and uh, have fellowship with you and come near to you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would encourage us with these things. Help us, Lord, to be, uh, to be saying the gospel to each other this year. Help us to be encouraged, Lord, that uh, you are for us. Help us, Lord, not to doubt that when we see circumstances and events around us that might be painful and hard and difficult, Lord. We thank you that these are in your providence too and in your care. And so, Lord, help us to trust you. And uh, Lord, we, we pray that we might rejoice that you have given the best to us and, and all things are yours. That, Lord, you will give us all the other things that we need alongside the very best that you've given us in Jesus. So help us, Lord, to be encouraged and be strengthened and helped by your word this year. Lord, we ask that you would bless us and our friends who are not with us this morning, Lord. We're thinking of them. We pray that you'd bless them too as they hear your word today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.